welcome to AI Expert Lockdown Spotlight Series. Uh, we're conducting interviews with key financial industry stakeholders uh, to understand the challenges that have come up due to COVID-19 uh, and the lessons learned. Um, our guest today is the Honourable MP for South Cambridgeshire, uh, Anthony Brown. Anthony is also CEO of British Bankers Association and the co-founder of Homeowners Alliance. He also serves on the board of several financial technology firms. Um, hi, Anthony. Welcome to the AI Expert uh, Lockdown Spotlight. Could you just give us um, a quick introduction? Tell us a bit about yourself. Uh, indeed. I, well, I was actually a journalist for about 20 years. I was economics correspondent of the Observer newspaper uh, and the Times and, uh, and uh, the BBC, rather, and then chief political correspondent and Europe correspondent of the Times. And I then worked as an economic advisor to one Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London in his first term. And I was in charge of economic recovery in London after the financial crisis uh, back in 2008. Uh, and then I became chief executive of the British Bankers Association, leading the reforms of the banking industry for five years. Uh, and then working with a range of financial technology companies. Uh, and I'm now, as you mentioned, um, MP for South Cambridgeshire, my home constituency. Uh, since December, I sit on the Treasury Select Committee, which is uh, the main committee in Parliament that scrutinises all Treasury and financial services uh, issues. So I've been doing interviews with the Chancellor and the, governor, the new Governor of the Bank of England, and indeed the old Governor of the Bank of England. Uh, and I'm also on the uh, Finance Bill Committee, which is the committee that uh, scrutinises and will amend the budget legislation for the budget that just happened in March. Fantastic. Well, it's, it's uh, great to meet you. Um, my second question is, um, what have been the standout observations for you on uh, some of the kind of drastic changes that have been taking place? Well, clearly, I mean, everything has changed. Uh, none of us expected to go through what often seems like a, a very fast moving Hollywood horror movie. Uh, and, uh, you know, it is really quite extraordinary what has happened. Uh, one thing, one observation though, is just how quickly people do adapt, that we are doing things like uh, interviews, virtual interviews like this. Uh, Parliament, for example, has worked out how to do virtual voting, uh, uh, doing virtual debates with MPs and their constituencies around the country. This has never, uh, never ever happened uh, before. People are doing uh, uh, homeschooling, uh, is, you know, the schools uh, closed down here. Uh, but the imp economic impact is absolutely huge. It is extraordinary. With There's been predictions of 30% decline in economic output for the uh, second quarter of the year. Uh, and there are some sectors that have really suffered 100% loss of income. So uh, hospitality being the obvious one, bars and restaurants have to be closed by government order. Uh, there are some sectors that are doing well, I mean, notably uh, supermarkets. But that's the unusual one. I mean, you see today uh, various stories from the airline industry uh, that have suffered something like a 95% drop in passenger numbers. Car output in the UK has declined by 97%. Uh, financial services, I'm sure we'll come on to that, uh, has actually been remarkably resilient. And uh, I, I indeed yesterday was speaking to various uh, chief executives of the UK banks about their response to uh, coronavirus. And I have to say one thing that I find really reassuring is that the banking industry is after the financial crisis now very well capitalized and they can deal with a shock like this that no one was predicting without anyone questioning whether the banks can continue as uh, viable institutions. They absolutely are sufficiently well capitalized to cope with this crisis. Yeah, um, that's really interesting. And yeah, of course, lots of drastic changes. Um, how has your life changed uh, during COVID-19? Well, like everyone else, some uh, are working from home, uh, you know, except with a very few. So, I mean, I've left home for work reasons, I think, four times in the last six weeks. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, I'm spending a lot more time with my wife and my children who are homeschooling. So we've set up offices and uh, they've got different places where they're uh, doing online learning through Zoom phone calls like this with their teachers. Uh, and it's, you know, and I'm doing Zoom uh, drinks with friends in the evening, uh, friends from around the world. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, uh, but it's not pleasant. And I, but I am very lucky in the sense that uh, as an MP, I, I, I'm not, obviously I have to worry about my job at the moment until the next elections, uh, whereas I'm speaking all the time to my constituents. And uh, there are people who are in you know, extreme financial distress. People have been building up businesses for 20 years and through absolutely no fault of their own, suddenly they get a 100% loss of uh, uh, business. And the, um, 
uh, obviously the government has ploughed in a huge amount of support for business, a whole range of different schemes from the job retention scheme where you can furlough staff. There's been grants for like, literally donations of money for smaller businesses uh, in, the, in the retail and hospitality sectors. Uh, and then a whole range of other loan schemes like the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme. We've got a bounce back loan scheme, which is where you don't do the banks don't have to do credit checks and all this is lending support to uh, the economy uh, really to try and preserve companies and make sure they can carry on going until we get out of this crisis because we will get out of it uh, at some point but the economic impact will be uh, absolutely huge but it would have been I'm sure far greater if the government hadn't done all these support mechanisms but there are still companies that fall between the gaps I'm all too aware of that of people whose personal circumstances don't quite fit in with the government programs and uh, you know I don't want to play down the you know the suffering that those people are experiencing at the moment. Sure and um, just coming back to the financial sector um, in your role as the CEO of the British Bankers Association what are the key challenges that banks are facing now? Well, I, I, I was CEO of the British Bank Association for five years. I'm, I'm no longer CEO of the, uh, the BBA, but obviously I'm still well uh, in touch with the banking sector. I mean, the, the, the main role is actually supporting their customers and uh, rolling out the various government programs. So the, I mentioned the coronavirus business interruption loan scheme, C-bills uh, or CIBILS, uh, and uh, then the bounce back loans, uh, which they launched just on Monday. And this is up to £50,000, up to 25% of turnover, interest free for a year, no credit checks, no viability checks, no um, affordability checks. They do have to do KYC checks to make sure there's no money laundering going on. Uh, and they had 100,000 applications in the very first day. And this is, uh, you know, an extraordinary uh, scale operation, which the banks had to uh, tune up for. They're also having to deal with uh, distance uh, uh, working from home as well. I mean, banks are no different from the rest of us. Uh, they, they're, you know, hum run by human beings who can be infected by viruses. Uh, and uh, they've had to send a lot of staff working from home, including uh, trying to keep their branch network open. I think about 80% of branches are open. They're deemed essential by the government. Uh, and but still, they struggle to get staff to, uh, you know, to be able to work there with in suitable um, with suitable social distancing, um, and uh, there's so they face all that uh, business. But ultimately, I think that the ba the banks are in a far stronger position than many other sectors of the economy from this. Uh, but actually their fortunes in the long run do depend on the fortunes of the economy and the, the best thing for the banking sector in the long term is a strong healthy economy so uh, if we do end up with a really severe uh, depression now then the banks will suffer but I, I personally believe that although we've got a very sharp downturn now uh, we will uh, it will come back maybe not to exactly where we were before but in a, in a few years time hopefully uh, we will be and so the, the banking sector will be uh, you know, in the medium or long term, we'll be in a strong position. Um, you, you sort of touched on on remote working there and the, the challenges that poses. Um, what steps can firms or, or banks do to kind of mitigate these challenges? Well, the the, the banks have been doing uh, like. Um, like the rest of us have been working out which of their staff can work from home and which ones uh, uh, which ones can't and actually uh, it's I think surprised a lot of people just quite how much the banks can have staff uh, at home uh, and doing things on zoom calls and so on actually huge parts of their operations they can be uh, at home and I know a lot of the banks are realizing actually you don't necessarily need 5,000 people in the building or 10,000 people in uh, one large building and and there's certainly speculation that that whole business model of getting many thousands of people to work together in one building uh, is uh, you know not for the future um, I think this this pattern of distance uh, working of working from home uh, will continue certainly the lockdown is going to be a slow exit uh, you know it's not going to suddenly stop tomorrow uh, unless we miraculously discover a virus that we can inoculate everyone with uh, overnight uh, not going to happen uh, the uh, so I think the banks will find out that actually you know very, they'll have to operate with far fewer of their staff uh, in the office, it might lead to really long term uh, changes, although fundamentally we are so although there are many advantages to working from uh, home uh, fundamentally we are social beings, and I think people working together in meetings uh, where you are literally physically face to face as opposed to via conference call uh, can be a lot more creative and productive and I, I think that you know essential part of human psychology will win out in the longer run and they 'll definitely 
still be a place for offices in the future uh, with reasonable number of people there but I think probably there will be more distance learning and certainly less uh, long distance traveling I think uh, people realize they can do uh, uh, business and have meetings uh, over video conferencing like this. I was speaking to somebody earlier who's uh, uh, earlier today who's a lawyer who used to go to fly to New York for a two-hour meeting and then fly back uh, and actually you, really, you know and that takes two days out and costs a lot of money and it's not good for the environment uh, and actually you can do 95% of it just with a video call. Sure and I guess that kind of leads into my next question which is about the um the kind of lessons being learned um, during the COVID-19 crisis. What do you think we're learning um, in terms of a society, but also what can firms learn during the crisis? Well, one of the things that we've learned as a society is, uh, to uh, uh, repeat the phrase, uh, is that we're all, we are all here together. Um, and uh, we are, what, what has been really reassur re reassuring and reaffirming is, as an MP is just seeing the number of people volunteering to help their neighbours, uh, that in when there is a real crisis, that people do all come together and, and help out. And that's been great. And I'm sure that, you know, that happened again during the Second World War. Uh, and, you know, hopefully some of that will uh, continue going forwards. And we are a lot more flexible and resilient than we sometimes uh, think of ourselves as being. I think the changes there will be are the, the primary one is that trends that are happening already, uh, some of them have been massively accelerated by this. So you look at things like uh, online shopping, people buying their goods and services uh, uh, online rather than actually going to a shop or an office. Uh, that clearly was gathering pace already, but actually we've probably got 10 years of growth of it concentrated into three months, uh, and that will largely uh, probably largely stay and we won't go back on that. So I think it's a real challenge for the high street. I think it's a real challenge uh, for airlines, uh, as I was saying, that people learnt uh, that actually, because they've been forced to use video conferencing like this or video calls, video meetings, uh, they've learned they don't have to travel quite as much as uh, they thought they had to. Uh, and uh, so I think there'll, there'll be a lot more of that and airline travel will take a long time to recover. And you've seen today, uh, Virgin have said they're going to move out of Gatwick. I think British Airways have uh, uh, Im implied uh, or has been reported that they're thinking about moving away uh, from Gatwick Airport as well. And these are, these are big uh, changes. I think the, um, the challenge for firms uh, over the current year uh, is working out how to do distance, uh, social distancing at work. And there are some jobs where that's possible. Uh, and office-based jobs, such as uh, primarily the jobs in banks, often you can have people two desks apart, they'll be two metres apart. Uh, that is uh, possible, but actually how do you social distance in a, in a lift? If you're working in a tall building, uh, you can only have one person in a lift. If you want to be two metres away from everyone else, you can't get thousands of people uh, you know, onto all the different floors if you've only got one person in a lift at a time. Uh, we can't all of us work, walk up all those stairs the whole time. That's going to be, uh, that's going to be a real uh, challenge. Yeah, I think I saw an article the other day about how this might be the end of kind of banks being based in uh, skyscrapers. So I think that would definitely be a... But I think the long, the, the long term, uh, the, the, re the reason why I emphasise that the, the trends that are already happening, it, this can accelerate it and you won't go back. But I think ultimately a lot of things will, uh, you can overplay, nothing will ever be the same again. Uh, and so like saying they're not going to be to all buildings. Uh, I was in New York on September 11th, 2001. I saw the Twin Towers collapse. And uh, at the time, everyone said, uh, well, we're not going to work into all buildings ever again. Everyone will be too frightened. But actually, you've now got the uh, Freedom Tower, I believe it's called, that's even uh, higher than the Twin Towers were. Uh, you, can, you can overplay these things. And I think the, uh, we are in the depth of the crisis at the moment. We're coming out of the peak, but in the depth of the economic crisis. But the fundamental sort of economics of buildings is the same. The fundamental human psychology of wanting to work with other people uh, is the same. This virus will be beaten one way or another. We'll work out ways to treat it so that it's, so when you do get it, it's not as lethal. We'll work out ways to vaccinate against it so people don't get it in the first place. Uh, and it will just become one of those things. Uh, and you read human history and it's full of, we call it pandemics nowadays, but they used to call it plagues and pestilences. Uh, they're, they're terrible while they happen, but they do, you do, all societies got over it, will get over it a lot better and, and more quickly now than we did 100 years ago or 400 years ago because we've got uh, modern medical science. But 
uh, we will get over it. And I think you'll see some trends that have accelerated and they'll stay uh, in, a, in a new place like online shopping. But other trends, I think, will uh, you know, we'll revert back nothing, uh, to our old ways. You know, pubs might be closed for this year, but I can guarantee you that people will end up going back to bars and drinking with friends again. I think that's one fundamental part of human nature that won't change. Yeah, definitely part of uh, British culture as well. Um, I think uh, obviously hindsight is twenty twenty. but do you think firms were prepared in terms of their business continuity plans and risk management for a global pandemic? No, uh, firms weren't, countries weren't. Uh, I think uh, that this, when you ask about lessons to be learned, that we do need a lot more resilience in terms of supply chains uh, for companies. Uh, and you found a lot of companies that were dependent on China at the beginning, and they're so dependent on China that they couldn't get, they lost certain components. And you found this in car manufacturers, for example, that they had to stop, even though they their countries weren't affected at that time by coronavirus, they had to stop uh, production. Uh, you need to make sure you've got diversification of supply chains, so that if one supply chain goes down, uh, then uh, you can kick in with supplies from another area. Uh, there is, countries got... Um, uh, complacent is the wrong word about it but just weren't prepared because this is a one in a hundred year event it's very difficult to stay prepared for a once in a hundred year uh, event but actually we clearly need to treat uh, supplies of uh, um, uh, things like PPE as a national security issue we clearly need a lot more national stocks for it uh, we clearly need better resilience as a country and I'm talking about the UK here but it applies to other countries for things like uh, diagnostics and testing uh, so we don't depend so much on uh, foreign supply chains that actually we can use our own sort of national stocks there uh, and things like the same is true as things like ventilators etc and I'm sure there'll be a far wider range of things like uh, uh, pandemic preparations uh, and supply chain resilience and that you can move on to food for that as well uh, which will become far more priority for the country as a whole going forwards um, but that it's in, the, in human nature that if you have a once in a hundred year event then after sort of 50 years people forget about it and they uh, get used to their sort of comfortable ways again uh, and then something happens again it's a bit like snow in Britain uh, whenever there's snow in Britain because uh, it doesn't happen that often at least in the southern part of Britain different in Scotland uh, that uh, we're all caught by surprise and uh, everything stops working whereas in Norway I'm half Norwegian you know masses of snow every winter happens all the time everyone deals with it nothing stops uh, so when you have uh, irregular events, uh, it's far more difficult to remain and uh, keep prepared for them. And the same is true of uh, uh, pandemics. And uh, you, you kind of talked about earlier about this um, effect of trends being accelerated as a result of the pandemic. Um, do you think the current situation will act as a stimulus for digital transformation and automation? Yeah, absolutely. I think that uh, so one of the things that's made the this lockdown far uh, more bearable for people is the fact that we are now so digital, the fact we can do easy uh, conference calling on our laptops. Everyone can do it from their home uh, in a way that simply wouldn't have been possible just five years ago. You've got all the social media, which uh, is keeping certainly my children, I think children across the world, uh, in touch with each other uh, has made it far more bearable uh, not having that. Uh, and online shopping has progressed uh, massively and none of that is going to go back. That's all been massively uh, accelerated. People doing, uh, anybody wasn't doing online banking before, and I think most of us were, but they'll move on to uh, online banking. Uh, I think that uh, certainly in the, in the medium term, short to medium term, the problems with doing, getting large numbers of people to work in offices while we still have all this social distancing measures uh, if, uh, for business managers in banks and other industries uh, makes it uh, far more attractive to do uh, automation of people uh, uh, processes that use an awful lot of people because actually you don't have to worry about social distancing with, uh, with computer programs or uh, algorithms. Sure and um, what do you think the firms can do and, uh, and should do during these uncertain times to survive and um, what can they do to kind of retain their competitive edge and emerge even stronger from the crisis? Well, just what, what I added thought to the last question first is that the, the other thing is just uh, particularly relevant for AI experts is the role of artificial intelligence and big data. And actually uh, this epidemic has been uh, 
uh, modelled extensively, but people, the epidemiologists and the governments realised they need massive data uh, on people uh, to be able to model it and to be able to clamp down on it. And so that's looking at people's movements, looking at who people have contacts with. We're just launching uh, an app in the UK for to be able to do the tracking of the uh, epidemic. They've got uh, Google and Apple have worked together for an app used in uh, other countries exactly to gather the data about who's physically in contact with who and how the, the physical virus uh, might spread. And that that is all, uh, again, would be unthinkable even just five years ago using, using that scale of big data and that scale of uh, artificial intelligence to track in real, t real time and in real life uh, an epidemic. It was just without this technology, it would have been utterly uh, undoable before. If you ask me another question, I've forgotten what it was. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, no worries. It's about um, what, what can firms do and what should they do during these times to survive? Um, and, you know, how can they retain their competitive edge and emerge from the other side even stronger? And also, how do you see technology playing a role in that process, which you've already kind of touched upon? So the most important thing is to be flexible and entrepreneurial. And uh, to take, take a small example, far away from high finance is gyms. Uh, they've had to close down uh, and uh, play, play fitness studios have had to close down. Uh, some of them have gone online and they've started doing classes online. And actually, uh, they, the, certainly those that first started doing it had a, uh, a rapid advantage that a lot of people wanted to take part in it. They might get less amount of money per person doing it, but actually you can reach a far bigger audience. You can do a class of 40 people, a Pilates class or 50 people. You can do it globally. You can have people in other countries following your class without having to travel to you. And so the, 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 the fitness studios that have embraced technology, have embraced uh, this distance uh, fitness classes, as it were, virtual fitness classes, are actually doing really, really well. Whereas the ones that haven't adopted new technology or were stuck in their old business model uh, have just closed down, and that's it. They're, you know, and they might really struggle to uh, reopen when this gets over. You find. Um, uh, in my constituency, there are a lot of pubs that uh, traditionally didn't do takeaways, but they did serve food. Uh, they had to close down as uh, restaurants, uh, but actually some of them learned how to do takeaways and, they did, and some of them learned how to do deliveries and uh, got delivery drivers. And suddenly they found this huge demand uh, for their business. And actually it's not as good as it was beforehand, but uh, they are uh, thriving. There's food delivery companies that I have in my constituency. Uh, they're actually doing extraordinarily well. They've never... Uh, seen business like it. You see uh, companies, uh, there are a lot of uh, food wholesalers that serve, uh, generally just serve restaurants, or they never sell direct to uh, end consumers. Uh, and clearly they've lost all their business because the restaurants are all closed. Some of them have just basically shut up shop and said, well, we can't do anything. Some of them have said, well, let's sell direct to consumers. And the best way to do that is online. So it's actually created a whole new industry where you can get uh, so wholesale food, often you end up with quite big packages, but get wholesale food uh, direct uh, to the household. And the same with uh, my wife's been buying wine from a, a wine merchant that normally only sells to uh, restaurants. And actually they've now started selling uh, to the home. So I think you need to be all businesses. Uh, these are very sort of down to earth examples, but real world examples. All businesses need to be more versatile, more flexible uh, in the way they do things. And those that don't change their business models will be the ones that end up dying out. Yes, I think adapting is key. And, and what, what role can technology play in, in helping firms adapt? You already mentioned the gym example of virtual classes. Are there any other examples you can think of? Well, go, going virtual and going digital is uh, the key uh, thing for all businesses in this new environment. So one, one, another example, that's just a, a real world example from my uh, constituency is there's a lot of garden centers in South Cambridgeshire and they've all had to close. Uh, they are allowed to do deliveries. Uh, and but the trouble for them is they didn't have the websites to support it. You know, this is very basic technology. We're not talking about advanced AI here, uh, but they literally didn't have the websites to be able to place orders and to uh, track those orders and then uh, do the delivery. But a couple of them uh, sort of bit the bullet and uh, they sort of developed, they contacted software companies and quickly uh, developed the website technologies. I know this is quite sort of basic stuff, but these are garden centers who specialize normally in growing plants rather than uh, uh, having. Uh, e-commerce websites uh, and uh, they've they've um, 
had to adapt to the technology in order to be able to take up the opportunities. So I think for a lot of different uh, sectors, and the technology has allowed us to do things in new ways we couldn't do before. And some companies will be adopting, can only do those new things because of the technology. And some companies will be adopting that technology and will survive and thrive and others, uh, and others won't. Well, thanks, Anthony. We've covered some really interesting points. We talked about um, the kind of impact of COVID-19 on the economy and in particular the financial industry, some of the lessons that can be learned there from remote working. Um, we also sort of covered how unprepared, I guess, firms were for the crisis in terms of their business continuity and risk management. Um, and we also talked about the role that um, the crisis plays in accelerating these trends of automation and digital transformation and what companies can really do to use those technologies to survive and emerge even stronger. So uh, it's been a really interesting interview. I really enjoyed speaking to you. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, watching.